Today on That Guy With The Glasses, I'm going to attempt something completely original and something different, something that's never been done before, especially on this website. I'm going to take a look at one of my all-time favourite movie series and do a positive review on it. Now, taking this bold step in my evolution as a critic and a video reviewer, I figured it best to contact the people at Channel Awesome to make sure they were okay with me doing this. So I went straight to the top. None of that middleman stuff. I went straight to the top and spoke to the big cheeses. My bosses, to find out if they were okay with me doing this. I sent them a message and I'm expecting a reply any time now because communication is the byword here at Channel Awesome. Any minute now. thinking and it's very tricky to write your first intro for your first review which this is for me it's my first major review I say major it makes me sound really big-headed but some people open with a joke some people open with a catchphrase and some people open with a theme song and music video me I kind of gone for all three well except the joke hi I'm Welshy from Wales not Sad Panda from France, which some people seem to get confused by. Welshy, Panda, Panda, Welshy, Welshy, Wales, Panda, French, French accent. Honest to God, Rob, why do people get so confused between me and Sad Panda? Oh, sorry, uh, this is Rob. He's my monkey. He has a bit of trouble telling me it's Sad Panda apart. Don't you, Rob? Yeah, exactly. Anyway, I'm Welshy. I fucking love Scream. So yeah, by that intro you can probably tell that this isn't going to be a critique of the films, with the fourth one being released on the 15th of April 2011. I've timed these reviews so you can watch Scream 1 now and then Scream 2 and 3 after the release of 4. Why? Well, I'd like to say it's because I had a grand plan, but it's more for the fact that I let work pile up and my March videos became my April videos. So sue me. Now I know a lot of you out there are probably looking at this and thinking that this whole style of review is very similar to Dina and her game den, in that I'm doing a positive review on a movie that I love. And you'd be right. However, I totally anticipated the name calling I'm bound to get for doing this, calling me an original and telling me to get my own idea and that I'm a rip off. So I contacted Dina and asked her if she was okay with me doing a positive review on a movie that I love. And she was fine. Would you, Dina? Um... Thank you, Dina. Now, enough of these silly accusations of copying. Let's get back to the review. Scream is one of those movies, like Halloween, that I can vividly remember watching for the first time. It was 1997, I was 16 years old, my parents and my brother were away for the weekend, and I had the house to myself. And through sheer luck, my parents had been to the video store the previous night and they rented Scream. On VHS, no less. Ooh, that's taking me back. So I put it in. I was home alone, I was 16, and there was a film with an 18 certificate lying in wait for me to put it in. Any of you would have done the same thing. And I'll be honest, the film scared the hell out of me. Looking back though, it's amazing to think how much Scream changed the horror landscape for its time. Before Scream, the norm was for the Superman killer or the stalker zombie. Scream pretty much reinvigorated the slasher genre and the whodunit, and it also moved away from the zombie killer. And it brought back the costume killer. Now I know this had been done before, but Scream made it cool again. And a lot of that had to go with the costume and the killer himself. He wasn't a superman, he was a human who could be harmed, and even better, he would actually run after his victims. And in that costume, that was scary. Scream also, not to a huge degree, but it did impact on the television landscape too. Now before Scream, he had Party of Five, which I'm assuming was a big hit stateside, but it was never that really big over here. It was popular, but it wasn't kind of the mainstream sort of attention that American shows these days get. Following the success of Scream though, anything Kevin Williamson had touched was greenlit, and one of the projects was Dawson's Creek. Now I'm assuming it was a hit stateside, 
stateside because it was pretty big over here for its first few seasons. As memory serves, the only program that really accomplished that before that was 90210. So in a way it's because of Scream that we got Dawson's Creek which gave us this and this. But it did give us this. Oh, it was... So yeah, every cloud does have a silver lining. And one of the reasons I love Halloween so much, and there is a reason for me bringing this up considering Halloween appears in Scream, is that by the end of Halloween it had pretty much created three stars. It had Jamie Lee Curtis, she became a star through that film. It had Michael Myers, who became an icon because of that film. And in a way, although I'm not saying it, it, invent it didn't invent the genre, but it really put the genre on the map, the slasher genre. The slasher genre came out of Halloween leaps and bounds ahead of any other genre in the horror field because of how good that film is and how powerful that film is and how everything is done right on a really low budget. Scream also had a really low budget and it also comes away with three stars. By the end of Scream you've got the phone voice Hello Sydney which is so iconic and so scary and so chilling. You've got the ghost face mask which I mean even now, over, what, over 10 years later, you can still see this mask on sale, you still see people wearing the mask on Halloween. And I always felt that Jimmy Kennedy came out of this like a star. Everybody's a suspect! Kennedy plays Randy Meeks, a movie geek in the film. And he's so good in this role. It's his iconic role. It's the role he will always be remembered for. And it's nothing on the scale of, say, a Jack Sparrow, where Johnny Depp was born to play Jack Sparrow. And Anthony Hopkins was born to play Hannibal Lecter and Jennifer Aniston was born to play Jennifer Aniston. It's not on the scale of that, but it's still the actor's iconic role. It's the role he will always be remembered for. I mean, even now, in Scream Circles, he's still talked about in the role because he's so good in the role. We open with one of the most famous scenes in horror history and undoubtedly the most powerful scene in the movie, on a ringing phone, which is duly answered by Casey Becker, played by Drew Barrymore. Now given what's about to happen in this scene, what made it so shocking and effective is that Barrymore was marketed as the star of the film. She did a lot of the press work, she was on the poster, and for all intents and purposes, now keep in mind this was before the internet was the huge spoiler machine that it is today, everyone thought she was the star of the film. She gets into a semi flirtatious mood with the unnamed caller as she makes popcorn and discusses scary movies. This again sets the viewer off balance. While the whole killer phoning the house thing has been done before, the dialogue in this scene is interesting because it sets up that the characters are aware of horror movies. Yeah, now I know it's fairly old news these days, but back then in 1996 and 1997, it was pretty groundbreaking for a horror movie to be self-aware. And as you can imagine, the conversation doesn't stay flirtatious for long. Why do you want to know my name? I want to know who I'm looking at. And then takes a downright twisted turn. What do you want? To see what your insides look like. Back in 97, I was terrified watching this sequence. I'm not gonna lie. I was on my own, it was 10 in the evening, I was terrified. I'd never really seen anything like this before. But I mean, it's Drew Barrymore. She's gonna be fine. Right? The caller, who claims he's outside, reveals that he has Casey's boyfriend, Steve, tied up in the backyard. And then, in a moment I never really realised until I rewatched these films, he utters the words that would become famous to another horror franchise almost ten years later. I wanna play a game. <laughs> then he dies right now. The game? Movie trivia. And the questions? Horror. Name the killer in Halloween. Casey gets the warm-up question right. Michael. Michael. <laughs> yes. Very good. Now for the real question. No! But for the real question. Name the killer in Friday the 13th. Jason! 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 <laughs> I'm sorry. That's the wrong answer. Uh-oh. Meaning Steve loses the game. Now, truly terrified, the killer asks her to guess which door he's at. When she can't, through sheer fear, the killer makes his presence well known and breaks through the door. Running through the house, she grabs a knife and backs into the yard while the killer stalks the house looking for her. Seeing a car's headlamps and deciding to leave her hiding spot, she chances a glance. Holy shit! But this is Drew Barrymore and she's not going to go down without a fight. A phone to the face and she's away, but then she makes the classic horror mistake. She stops running. The killer attacks and mortally wounds her, and then in a scene that can shock people even today, the killer stabs her through the throat, which destroys her vocal cords in the process. The occupants of the car turn out to be Casey's parents, but they don't notice her struggle as they enter the house, only to hear her final words on the phone she's still holding in her hands as they find her gutted and hanging from a tree just outside the house. Okay, first off, 
I cannot begin to express how powerful this scene was when people saw it back in 1996-1997. I mean, it's still powerful now, but back then, the big star signing up for a film and then being killed off in the beginning or halfway through, it wasn't really done. I mean, these days it's done quite a lot. But back then, nobody expected it because Drew Barrymore was so involved with the press for the release of the film and she was marketed as the star. So to see her go right at the beginning was a hell of a shock. And it still shocks today. The only problem with this scene, and it's more of an afterthought than the scene itself, because there's nothing wrong with the scene. The scene is beautiful. But it peaks the film way too soon. Because there is nothing in the film that can match this moment for its sheer intensity. That's not to say the rest of the film is bad, because it isn't. But in terms of intensity and shock, nothing can match this. But it is something that Kevin Williamson and Wes Craven learnt from and carried over into Scream 2. Moving away from Casey, we cut to Sydney Prescott, played by Nev Campbell, typing away on her keyboard. After hearing a noise outside, which she then investigates, this introduces us to Sydney's boyfriend, Billy Loomis, played by Skeet Ulrich, and a brief appearance by Sydney's father, who, we learn, will be leaving town tomorrow, meaning Sydney will be all alone for the weekend. Important plot point, Sydney is the daughter of Maureen Prescott, a woman who was found raped and murdered in her home almost exactly one year ago. So Sydney is understandably jumpy about certain subjects. Now, while this could have been handled in a negative way, the writing and the performance helps highlight this part about Scream that makes it stand out from the current crop of horror remix these days. Likeable characters. And, yeah, I'll admit, they almost do fall into that pit of being the typical horror character, with the virgin, the best friend, the boyfriend, the movie geek. But they're written so well, and they're just rounded enough that they manage to avoid that cliché. For instance, you have Sydney, who begins this film as the typical horror virgin. But unlike other films where she's just the virgin because she's just not into that sort of thing, she's a virgin because she walked in on her mother's raped and bloody corpse a year earlier. Which, let's be honest, would put anyone off sex. Especially when there's stories of her mother and her sexual escapades all over town. Sydney is the heroine, and in a departure from films of today, she's likeable and you root for her. She's friendly, but not bland. She's strong, but not an ice maiden. And Campbell captures the horror spirit of the classic horror heroines like Laurie. Oh, fuck no, not that one. And you support her through it. Boyfriend Billy wants sex. Sydney doesn't. And despite a puppy dog look, which for some reason doesn't work, I wonder why, Billy departs. The next day, the town of Woodsboro is awash with news coverage of the deaths of Casey and Steve. It's at school we meet Tatum, played by Rose McGowan. Going back to what I said earlier about the character dynamic in Scream, compared to the horror films of today, Tatum is another good example of the differences. Tatum, the best friend. A role in any other film, and certainly the more recent films of today, would have been a throwaway role. What fleshes her out is that unlike other films, she's not a complete bitch. She's feisty and spunky, but she really, really does care about Sydney. There isn't one point in this film where you see her attack Sydney or badmouth Sydney behind her back. The two have a meaningful conversation about halfway through regarding Sydney's mother. And while Tatum certainly believes the rumours, she never once hurt Sydney with this knowledge. She acts like a real person and a real friend. As the police investigate the murders, we're introduced to our principal characters, Tatum's brother, Deputy Dewey Riley, played by David Arquette, the local sheriff, the headmaster, E, it's the Bones. And later we meet Tatum's complete ass, but for some reason amusing boyfriend, Stu, played by Matthew Lillard, in a role that thankfully doesn't require him to go outside his acting range. Okay, really? Did I just say acting range? And traditional horror geek and surely dead meat, Randy Meeks, played by the aforementioned Jamie Kennedy. With the principal cast pretty much all introduced, the film sets about building tension and are you listening to this platinum films? Not relying on jump scares. Returning home, Sydney, displaying the kind of intelligence that's almost non-existent in today's horror films, decides she would rather not stay home alone in a house in the middle of nowhere and arranges with Tatum to stay with her. So Tatum says she'll pick her up after practice. With a few hours to go before Tatum arrives, Sydney falls asleep and is awoken a few hours later by a phone call from Tatum to announce she's on her way. A second phone call sparks one of the most iconic lines of the series. Hello, Sydney. Initially, Sydney thinks the call is Randy, playing a prank, and plays along. But when questioned whether she likes scary movies, Sydney utters one of the greatest lines in horror, basically summing up the entire slasher genre in one sentence. Oh, it's just, what's the point? They're all the same. Some stupid killer stalking some big-breasted girl who can't act, who's always running up the stairs when she should be going out the front door. It's insulting. Calling the caller's bluff that he's on the front porch, she goes out to investigate and finds no body there. Bored of the conversation, she goes to hang up. If you hang up on me, you'll die just like your mother. <laughs> Sure didn't. 
back inside with the door locked, Sydney's safe. Well, not really. Managing to fight off the killer, but with the door locked, in a delicious slice of irony, she does what she just claimed would be the flaw in the horror films. She runs up the stairs, managing to call the police over the internet. But the killer has disappeared, and suddenly Billy has appeared. Hmm, the game's afoot, especially when Billy's phone drops to the floor. For you kids out there, let me just clarify. Back in 1996 or 1997, mobile phones weren't the essential life tool that they are today. So seeing one on the floor is a perfectly legit reason for Sydney to suspect Billy at this moment. Sydney, doing the natural thing, runs like hell. <laughs> I've always liked that scene. Billy's arrested and carted off to jail while Sydney is taken in for questioning. It's here we officially meet Courtney Cox's character, Gail Weathers, and her cameraman Kenny. Weathers, a tabloid journalist who has a history with Sydney due to Sydney testifying against Cotton Weary, the man who went to jail for the rape and murder of her mother. Weathers believes Cotton to be innocent and has a book due out later in the year which details the court case. At the police station where Billy is questioned, and then kept inside until his phone records can be checked, Sydney learns that her father never checked into the hotel he told her he'd be staying at and is now missing. Leaving the station through the back entrance, Sydney is ambushed by reporters led by Gail. And, after an off-the-cuff remark, I'll send you a copy. Sydney doesn't seem to like that. Back at Tatum, Sydney and Tatum discuss the possibility of Billy being the killer. And, in a scene which is a serious departure from the movies of today, it's a simple little scene between the two of them. Just listen to it for a moment. Do you really think Philly did it? He was there, Tatum. He was destined to have a flaw. I knew he was too perfect. It's a nice scene, and it really shows the softer side of Tatum's character. Now, imagine if Rob Zombie had written that scene. What up, Dick Lickless? Dude, suck it up, ho. We got a fucking theme going on. Don't screw it up. Yeah. Now I don't like them as much. Things seem relatively calm, but before turning in, Sydney gets another call. Hello, Sydney. And to build the list of suspects, Dewey doesn't appear in the scene until the killer hangs up. Hmm, interesting. Hello. God, he's a man, he's a guru. You're one microscopic cog in his catastrophic plan, designed and directed by his rage. 